Hello military aviators, Sky here, and today, finally, we will meet the plane that has become a symbol of the 4th generation fighter jets, the main aerial spear of dozens of countries and just a very popular combat vehicle, familiar to any school kid. The F-16 Fighting Falcon is a multi-role fighter aircraft developed by General Dynamics in the early 1970s. It became the most widespread 4th generation fighter, delivered in the amount of more than 4600 units. And this figure is not final. Unlike the older brothers, the beloved F-16 is not even planning to leave the production lines of both the current owner, Lockheed Martin, and the facilities of several other countries. Let's see how this love was born. Of course, as it should be in novels about eternal love, this story begins with a scuffle. Like with all 4th generation American fighters, the history of the F-16 began long before its birth, in the early 1960s. At that time, the prevailing theory was that in the future, the air combat would mainly be centered on the long-range missile interceptions, without entering close air combat. This concept seemed logical and very relevant. The main problem of the American military were the Soviet bombers, and the missile technologies were developing at such an enormous pace that everyone considered these sparkling arrows to be the cure for all problems. The second big topic in the military aviation was the economy. There was a lot of different aircraft in service, and this colorful fleet was getting more and more difficult and expensive to keep in shape. The Pentagon, trying to reduce costs of creation and maintenance of the new equipment, came to a conclusion that there was a need for deep unification, meaning the creation of a single fighter for all military branches, which in the end became the F-111. It was a breakthrough aircraft, but the plan to adapt it for everyone was not realized. The Air Force applied it, but the Navy needed a slightly different plane, and they created the F-14. Already at the birth of Tomcat, the actual experience of warfare began to undermine the beautiful idea of long-range missile interception. This concept was far from being as effective as was thought previously. At this time, a new concept started to take shape. Based on the experience of air battles in Korea and Vietnam, a group of aviators and engineers, led by Air Force Colonel John Boyd and mathematician Thomas Christie, formed the Energy Maneuverability Theory of Combat. This concept was the opposite of old ideas, a light jet for dogfights instead of a heavy aircraft with powerful missiles for long-range interception. These ideas were to be implemented in the next 4th generation fighter. In 1965, research was initiated as part of two programs, the Advanced Day Fighter ADF, and the Heavy Multi-Purpose Fighter Experimental FX. The ADF seemed like a great option, but in 1967, a dangerous Soviet bird changed the priorities. The MiG-25 was a heavy, high-speed interceptor capable of flying at speeds of over Mach 2.5 and attacking targets at long distances. The lightweight ADF seemed helpless against such a monster. In the end, the military chose the heavy version, and the result of their work was the F-15 Eagle, taking off in 1972. Boyd's team, which had already become famous as the Fighter Mafia, was of course furious. The F-15 showed excellent results, but it was still too complex, expensive and heavy. They lobbied for research continuation on the light fighter. Then there was another clash of interests. On the one hand, the Fighter Mafia, which did not recognize neither the F-14 nor the F-15, and demanded to finally create a normal fighter. On the other, the military industry, that had just created the F-15 and did not want to have another competitor in their own homeland. And the Congress was looking at all this and thinking. Pentagon promised one fighter for everyone, then the sailors decided to create another one for themselves. Now the Air Force has created another for itself. And here you are saying that the Air Force needs yet another plane? What's next? Will the Navy create the second plane too? Hey, stop it, come on! However, there was some truth in his disputes. Despite the fact that the F-15 was an excellent fighter, the Air Force realized that it was expensive and they simply cannot afford to buy enough Eagles to cover all tasks. The idea of creating a light addition seemed logical. So, the new program found support, and the military initiated the Lightweight Fighter, or LWF program, and presented the terms of reference. Five companies answered the call. Boeing, General Dynamics, Lockheed, Northup and Vought. Lockheed and Vought quickly left the race, while the Boeing model was in favor, but in the end, the General Dynamics model 401-16B prototype surpassed the competitor, 
It was very similar, but still had a number of better design solutions. The third participant, Northrop P600, was a more complex but also very promising aircraft that reached the final round. General Dynamics and Northrop received financing to create their prototypes, which received the YF-16 and YF-17 indexes respectively. Both aircraft were supposed to fly already in 1974. The pace was achieved. The first YF-16 was rolled out of the General Dynamics assembly hangar in 1973, and by the beginning of 74, it was delivered to the Edwards Air Force Base for testing, with the first flight scheduled for February 2nd. These plans were also surpassed, even though by accident. In January, a couple of weeks before the start of flight tests, the fighter was passing a series of high-speed runs, during which the onboard systems, engine and landing gear were being checked. However, during one of the runs, the aircraft lost stability and began to swing, screeching the ground with its wingtip and tail stabilizer. Because of this, the hard-to-control aircraft changed direction and was about to roll out of the runway, which at that speed would most likely lead to a crash. The pilot had no choice but to bring the engine to the maximum and take off. It all ended well. Six minutes later, the plane landed. Yes, that was the maiden flight of one of the most famous fighters in the world. In the desert, almost without witnesses, controlled by a sweaty test pilot under the screams of the flight director. The General Dynamics management was not happy with this news. Ahead of schedule is of course cool, but the fact that the first flight was actually an aircraft incident was harmful to the image in the face of fierce competition. So the work was quietly continued, and on February 2nd, in the presence of guests, another first flight was conducted, calling it the real first test, repeating a hundred times that everything went according to plan. But the deadlines still got tighter. On February 5th, the YF-16 broke the sound barrier for the first time, and soon it was joined by the second prototype. In summer, the Northrop YF-17 prototype made its maiden flight. But the Congress continued to push, spoiling the military's appetites. Just as they approved the LWF program for the US Air Force, yes, the Navy stated that the F-14 is too complex and expensive, that it would not be able to carry out all the tasks, and they needed another plane that could replace light fighters and attack aircraft. Their Navy Air Combat Fighter, or the NACF program, risked becoming another expensive adventure, but was necessary. Politicians approved it, but with a condition. There is no more money for new jets. If you want a new aircraft, you have to work with the Air Force tender. And then another voice was heard from across the ocean, this time very helpful. A group of NATO allies, Norway, Denmark, Netherlands and Belgium, announced that they want to participate in the LWF program. Their air forces were flooded with a huge number of obsolete fighters, such as the F-104, and required an addition of something more modern. It was great news for the Pentagon. NATO could take part in the program, support it financially and, more importantly, purchase a decent amount of new fighters. At the same time, they demanded the establishment of licensed production at their facilities. But unlike the F-14 and F-15, the future LWF was quite simple, so the technology transfer was not a problem. As a result, the joint work was approved, and the LWF program was renamed into the Air Combat Fighter, or the ACF program. Yeah, they sure love coming up with new abbreviations. However, the ACF was facing European rivals. Mirage F1, Sepikat Jaguar and Saab 37E. The competition was heating up. At this time, the YF-16 became a favorite. It performed a little better in close combat maneuvering and the pilots flying both prototypes liked it more. In addition, it was equipped with the Pratt Whitney F-100 engine, like the F-15, which allowed to reduce the costs for maintenance of common power plants. In January 1975, the YF-16 became the official winner of the tender. The Air Force planned to purchase a batch of 650 fighters, with a further increase in the fleet to 1400 units. The Navy surprised everyone again. The Congress wanted to save money on the unification of the Air Force and Navy fleets, hoping that they would use the same fighter. But in May 1975, sailors said that the YF-17 was better for them. Some lagging behind the 16s was not critical, while technical specifications and equipment were more preferable. They, along with Northup, modified the plane and adopted it under the name FA-18 Hornet. But let's go back to our today's hero. As part of the first transaction, the Air Force ordered 8 fighters, 6 single-seat and 2 double-seat models. 
The design of the aircraft was also slightly adjusted to simplify serious production and to introduce new equipment. Most of the elements became bigger, meanwhile the aircraft got heavier by almost a quarter. The first production F-16A started flying in the summer of 1978, entering the service in 1980. At that time, the aircraft received an official name, Fighting Falcon. Although the military often call it Viper, after the snake it looks a bit like due to its wing strikes, and after the Viper Space Fighter from Battlestar Galactica TV series, which at that time was at the top of all charts. At the same time, the Falcon was marching to Europe. At the Paris Air Show in 1975, the European participants of the program ordered 348 fighters. Production was established at the Dutch Fokker plant and at the Belgian Sapka plant near Brussels Charleroi Airport. Norway and Denmark were the suppliers of elements, the localization scale was quite high. The first fighter officially started its service in the Royal Netherlands Air Force in 1979, curiously earlier than the US Air Force fighter. The modern F-16 versions are supersonic, multi-role fighters with advanced aerodynamics and avionics providing excellent flight performance. The fighter is equipped with a fuselage blended wing and four-body vortex control strakes, a fairly classic solution for the fourth generation. This scheme allows to increase the internal volume for more equipment and fuel, and to increase the lifting force in maneuvering, while the vortex created by the strakes increases lift in normal flight. These solutions were developed in the early 60s, but the conservative aviators were barely applying them to earlier fighters. Since maneuverability was the most important goal of the LWF program, the F-16 wing received advanced mechanization, automatic slats at the leading edge, as well as standard ailerons and flaperons. In this regard, it turned out to be more complex than the F-15. However, unlike most of its peers, the F-16 has a triplane empennage with one vertical stabilizer, which also simplified the design. Plus, under the keel and along the fuselage spine, there is a fairing with additional equipment. The aerodynamic brake on the airplane is a little unusual. Technically, it has two split-flap speed brakes in the tail on both sides of the engine. The all-turning horizontal stabilizer is shifted back, and under the fuselage there is a pair of small rear strakes. Also in the tail under the engine, there is a tail hook like on the F-15, used in the event of the emergency landing. The F-16 has a three-leg landing gear, which despite the small track is quite powerful, reducing the requirements to quality of airfields. Since the air intake is located under the fuselage, the location of the front leg had to be changed. If it had remained in front under the nose, it would impair the quality of airflow into the engine and add the risk of foreign debris damage, so the leg had to be moved back under the air intake. Both the main combat and operational bonus of the F-16 is its power plant. Initially, the fighter was equipped with one Pratt Whitney F-100 PW-200, which is in fact a modification of the PW-100 from the F-15, with thrust reaching up to 106 kN. This single-engine design was very effective and became, in many respects, the key to success of the F-16, since having only one engine simplified maintenance. But in the beginning, the engine was causing many problems. The operation of the early production aircraft was subject to many restrictions, and in the mid-80s, the Air Force initiated a development program of the alternative engine, which became General Electric F-110. Over time, the engines were modernized, became more reliable and more powerful, reaching a thrust of 132 kilonewtons, and the mass production of the F-16 made it profitable for suppliers and convenient for customers, who were able to choose their power plant. Of course, planes with different engines are not quite the same, they differ in the design of nozzles, as well as in the size of air intakes. As it turned out, the F-110 had greater air consumption, so the air intake with these engines is slightly wider. Naturally, the airplane can be refueled in flight, since its range indicators are rather average. The combat radius of the F-16C is about 300 miles with armament, while the ferry range is about 2300 miles with drop tanks. Since it was made for the Air Force, the boom-style aerial refueling system was applied. The armament of the early F-16s is quite classic for the Air Force, and is not distinguished by the use of exotics, like the Phoenixes on the Tomcat. The versions A and B were equipped with the short-range AIM-9 Sidewinder and the medium-range AIM-7 Sparrow missiles. 
The jets brought up a bit later also had an ability to strike at ground targets using standard bombs, such as the Mach 82. And over time, the list of available weapons extended greatly, from light missiles to nuclear bombs, a real gladiator set. And of course, you can't have a dogfight without a good old Gatling gun. The F-16 received the 20mm M61A1 Vulcan. So, who's gonna control it? Since the F-16 was created for a fairly dense air battle, General Dynamics engineers gave the pilots a completely clear view with a bubble canopy. And yes, a mark for fans of the eternal war of sight sticks and yokes. The F-16 cockpit is equipped with sight sticks, and this is not just a design solution. The aircraft received a full-fledged fly-by-wire, the first mass-produced fighter to employ this system. Initially, the F-16's electronic eyes was the Westinghouse AN-APG-66 radar. Their shape had to be slightly changed to be placed inside the nose of the fighter, but the functionality remained quite decent. With the development of models, radars of course also changed, with increased capabilities. The new F-16E and F were already using the Northrop Grumman AN-APG-80 radars, with active electronically scanned arrays. Nevertheless, the fighter was created as quite cheap in production and operation, so it continued to go this way. 80% of the structure is made of aluminum, the share of composites is small, in this regard the machine is quite conservative. Most of the systems and internal components of the airframe are built with simplest maintenance in mind. The great pride of the General Dynamics engineers was the flight resource, more than 8000 hours. In general, the economy in operation and the large resource are among the main reasons for popularity of the F-16 in the world. At first glance, these features do not seem important in combat, but if you look at it from the point of view of long-term operation and maintenance of a large fleet, everyone would like to have a combat-ready air force, capable of protecting the homeland sky in a way that wouldn't ruin the homeland economy. The F-16 had several exotic options. One of them was the F-16 Vista, in fact a flying lab that flew in the early 1990s. New onboard equipment was installed on this plane, and also during the MATV program an engine with multi-axis thrust vectoring was being tested on it. The series Falcons did not receive such engines, but the development in electronics went far, some solutions even found their place on the F-35. Well, since we're reaching for the future toys, in some photos you can see the F-16 with an unusual air intake. This beauty is called a diverterless supersonic inlet, or the DSI. A pretty cool thing, allowing to simplify the design, make the plane less visible on radars and reduce aerodynamic drag. On the F-16 it was only a test, but again entered the production on the F-35. What's next? The prototypes YF-16CCV and F-16AFTI were working out the so-called independent maneuvering, in which the aircraft could shift in different planes without performing standard maneuvers. To do this, they were equipped with additional all-turning stabilizers under the fuselage and modified avionics. The ideas were curious, but did not go into the series. Another option was the F-16XL created in the 1980s, with a huge cranked arrow delta wing, an elongated fuselage and no horizontal tail stabilizers. The aircraft participated in the tender for the creation of a multi-role attack fighter, but lost it to the F-15E Strike Eagle, and subsequently was flying in the NASA research fleet. Over the entire period of operation, the F-15 technically passed through several generations. At first it was a couple, F-16A and F-16B. Then they were replaced with the upgraded F-16C and D, with many problems solved, updated avionics and an extended list of available weapons. Based on this couple, the F-16N for the Navy was created. However, they never reached the aircraft carriers. Sailors use these planes as enemy fighters in flight schools, so some of them may look like they are Russian. The new updated radars and engines came to the F-16E and F, which also received the optional conformal fuel tanks, causing some debate about aesthetics but solving the flight range issues. The most pumped version was the F-16V, where V stands for Viper. In several decades aviators accepted the name. Lockheed Martin equipped it with everything they could, from active electronically scanned array radar to computers and weapon systems. Due to all these solutions, many of which turned out to be very successful, the F-16 became the most popular 4th generation fighter in the world. 
In the United States, the fighter serves as part of the Air Force and National Guard, and the Thunderbirds aerobatic team flies on them. In total, there's about 1200 units. In addition to the United States, the F-16 is part of the Air Force in more than 25 countries in Europe, the Middle East, Asia and South America. And beside the Thunderbirds, the Singapore Air Force Black Knights aerobatic team flies on the Falcons. A total of about 4600 aircraft were delivered. In addition to Europe, the F-16s are manufactured under license in Turkey at the facilities of the Turkish Aerospace Industries Corporation, as the KF-16 version they are produced in South Korea, and of course in Japan, Mitsubishi produces the F-2 fighter, although they really don't like it when the F-2 is being called the local version of the F-16. Now Lockheed Martin's main goal is to enter the Indian market. At one time, their F-16IN participated in the Indian MMRCA Mega Tender, in which it did not succeed. But now they are offering local production of the F-21, that is in fact a modification of the F-16V Block 70. In the United States itself, serious production of the F-16 is declining, because the US Air Fleet is full and because Lockheed Martin is making its main replacement, the F-35 Lightning II. To please the newcomer, the Falcon production line is being moved from Texas to South Carolina. These fighters participated in most US military operations in recent decades and are expected to be actively used for quite some time, until they are slowly replaced by the F-35. In the rest of the world, the F-16 is also one of the main gears of the Eternal War Machine. Israel used it first in the early 1980s, almost immediately after receiving it, and, as we all know, continues to drive the planes to this day. Turkey and Pakistan and other countries are doing the same, to the extent of their foreign activities. What a long and tricky story this legendary fighter has. A story that may be coming to an end, but it is too early to forget the F-16. It'll probably continue cutting clouds for several more decades and get into fights with opponents that already exist and have not yet been created. Like and subscribe to the channel. Clear skies, fast flights and soft landings to you.